Well, good morning. Um, as you said, my wife is a nursing professor, so she's much smarter than I am. And so you're stuck with someone like me today. But um, my 15-year college reunion is this year. I don't feel like I've been out of college for 15 years. Um, but it brought back memories of when I graduated. Summer, or the yeah, spring of 2007, I graduated and the most terrifying time of my life was April of 2007 when I'm about to be done with school and I'm supposed to know what I am want to do with my life. I'm supposed to have a career path. I'm supposed to have a plan of what I'm doing with my life. And I got nothing. Like, it's, hey, like, I got a few interviews I've done through the phone and shockingly they never called back. And um, you're kind of that nervous point of like, I've gone to college. I've taken out student loans. Like, what, what am I doing? with this. And I had an interview set up, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I went to school in the middle of Ohio. And so about four or five hour drive and so, man, I'm going out to this interview. I'd done an internship at first Arnold the summer before, but they didn't call back either. And so I wasn't sure, hey, how am I going to be doing this? But I'm going to this interview. And so I packed up my minivan because I'm awesome. And I drive a minivan in college. And um, I, I leave at dawn. And I'm headed out. i got to get there by a certain time. And so I'm driving through the hills of West Virginia as the sun comes up. And my boss, the summer before, calls me and says, hey, how would you feel about coming back to First Arnold? I said, I wish you'd call me like two hours ago. I would have not even gone on this interview. Like, that's where I wanted to be to start with because I knew. And you may have had this feeling of just, I know where God wants me. And I can't explain why. I can't explain how. I just have this gut feeling and trust that, I have a piece about where God wants me to be. And so I'm like, well, i got to go to this interview. They're expecting me. So I went. But the entire time I'm thinking that, I'm going to end up back at First Arnold. I'm, I'm not coming to Pittsburgh. Like, God has placed me where he wants me. And so I ended up coming back to First Arnold, and I've been here for 15 years um, and not planning on leaving anytime soon. But I tell you that story because I look back on those 15 years, and I look at where God has brought me to and look at what he's also brought me through. And the path that God has for us is not always the one we choose for ourselves. And the path that God has for you is not going to be what you would want it to be necessarily. We have hopes and dreams and goals and we have this vision of this is how I want God to work and move. But it rarely happens that way. And I can tell you a story of how, hey, I went to an interview and I got the call for the perfect place I wanted to be. But it wasn't as perfect as it sounded. Because the job in Pittsburgh was a full-time job on staff at a church, benefits and pay. That makes my parents happy. With Arnold, it was, hey, let's come back and do an internship. This may go full-time. It was hard to convince my parents that that was as lucrative as the other one just sounded. But there's obstacles along the way in any path and journey. And there's things that are not going to be the smoothest. We want God to give us a six-lane highway freshly paved, but that's not always the way it's going to be. And so this morning, I want to talk with you about and not really share anything with you. I'm going to share God's word and let it speak for itself. But how, how do I know where God is leading me? How, how do I know the path that God has for me? Because I want to make an assumption this morning that most of us in this room know Jesus and we want to follow him with our lives. Some of you may not. And my hope is that you one day meet him and he changes your life the way he's changed mine. But I'm going to assume that you want to follow him with your life. But if you're like me, that's not always the clearest thing. And so we want to look at God's word because it has tons of examples of people that wanted to follow God's will. And there's examples of what that looks like, how we walk through those things, what it looks like to really follow the will of God for our life. And so I want to look at Numbers chapter 13 like today. If you had told me 15 years ago when I graduated with a youth ministry degree that I'd be doing a chapel talking about numbers, I would have told you no. But here we are. We're in Numbers. So Numbers chapter 13, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there. I'm going to give you a brief bit of background. Let's back up a little bit to Genesis. So God's people, Joseph, um, is thrown into a well by his brothers because they don't like him. But God works through his providence that he gets sent to Egypt. He becomes the number two guy in Egypt there and saves God's people from this famine, saves the Egyptians from a famine, and becomes the second most powerful man in the largest empire on earth at the time. His family moves there, and they um, just grow and grow, and they become this great nation while they're there, and that scares the Egyptian people, so they enslave them for hundreds of years. 
And God shows up and God rescues his people, sends Moses and uses the plagues to flex his power over Egypt. And Egypt says, leave, get out of here. And so they leave Egypt with the plunders of Egypt. God has allowed this to happen and they head on out to the promised land God has for them. Egypt is angry. They follow after them, send the world's greatest army after them. And God's people are trapped between the sea and his army. And God shows up again. And he clearly shows them he is God, he is powerful, he will take care of them. He splits the sea, God's people cross through on dry land, and then this world's greatest army is swallowed up by the sea. And then they are led to Mount Sinai, where Moses goes up to meet with God in the presence of God. And the Ten Commandments are given to him, but God's people grow impatient. God's people are kind of thinking, hey, it's taken Moses too long. And so they make idols. And they worship their own gods that they make for themselves that fit what they want and what they want to do. And judgment comes as a result of that. They were going to this promised land and God now says, you will wander until this generation has died off. And so they go into wandering. But even in the wandering, God's faithful to them. And he provides manna day in and day out. Hundreds of thousands of people walking through a wilderness, wandering in this wilderness where there's not food, there's not a Chick-fil-A to stop at, right? Right? And God provides this daily bread to, to provide and sustain them every day. God is continually caring for them. And that's where we pick up the story in Numbers chapter 13. After God has them wandering, it's the beginning of this wandering. He's been the providing. And this is where we pick it up. And we want to look at what do I need to know to live out God's will for my life? What are the things that I need to remember? Those things that I need to call to mind when... For you that are like seniors, in six months or so, your parents are going to have the same questions that my parents had. How are you going to pay back these student loans? Like, are you going to support yourself? Things like that. You're a freshman. You've changed your neighbor twice already. What does God want for my life? What do we need to remember? What do we need to look at in God's word to know what is God reminding us of about following his will for our lives? So Numbers chapter 13, four things I got for you. Number one, don't overthink it. Right? Don't overthink it. God's will is rarely hidden. It may not be what we want it to be, but it's not hidden very often. Verse 1 of chapter 13 says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their, of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the people of Israel. Like God's very clear, like, I'm going to give you this land, right? I think a lot of times we get in our minds of, all right, there's kind of a national treasure, scavenger hunt God sends us on to figure out what his will for our life is. God, if, if, if we're attentive and listening to him, he lays out his plan and he's clear on it. Think about God's people as they are wandering. They are dependent on God for everything that they get. They are wondering, is our wandering done now? Is it like tomorrow? Is it a week from now? Is it a day from now? When is it? And they're listening and attentive to God because they're uncomfortable. All right? We go sit at home. We got everything the way we want it. We're not really listening for God. But when we're uncomfortable, we're looking and attentive to God and his word. And so they're listening and God says, hey, this is what I have for you. And they jump at it. Okay, this is what we're going to do. And the next few 10 Ten verses, so list out the guys that they send. And I'm not confident enough to try to read all of their names in front of people I just met, so we're not going to do that, okay? But God lays out for them. Because they are attentive, they're listening and longing and waiting for it. For us, right, are we attentive to what God says? God has given us his word, and we can say, God, I I have your word, and I read the daily verse, and I read through and, and. But am I listening to God? Am I saying, God, I want to know you. You have revealed yourself to me through your word. I want to know your plan for the world. I want to know how my life fits in that. And I want to know that. I'm attentive and looking and longing for what you want for my life. Now, God's probably not going to lay out in, like, Timothy somewhere about how you should take a cyber, like, security job in this town and buy a house. Like, it's not going to be that specific. But I think when we really step back and understand God's will isn't hidden, but we rarely get every step. I think we fall into two, two spots. Either God gives us the big picture of this is what's going to happen and, the, and, and those individual steps to get there, we don't necessarily know those, or we get that next step in front of us, but we don't get the ending. 
There's an element of faith that comes in in either aspect of those, that I'm trusting God as I walk through this. And that he is going to lay out his plan and I don't have to hide. I don't have to try to figure out and look under all these like hidden rocks and whatnot and figure out where is this, this elusive will of God. God's will for his people is in his word. And if we're attentive to it, we can see what he wants. And if we're listening, we will find it. And so n- number two, right, so we have the people that have said, all right, God said, go here. We're going to list out these guys. These are the guys that we are going to send. These are the ones that are leaders. We're going to send them. We're going to go. Because we're listening for God's word and we are, we are attentive and we don't have necessarily the full plan. God says he's given us this land. I don't know how he's given us land. He just says, go spy it out. And the number two thing that we need to, to know is I'm along for the ride. I am not driving. Okay? You, in your life, you're not driving if you've given your life to Jesus. He is the one that is leading. He is the one that is calling the shots, and we're along for the ride in it. And there's a comfort in that. Have you ever been on a road trip, right? You, you have to know where you're going if you're driving, or at least have a phone that knows where you're going when you're driving. Shane and I were driving up here like today, and I got my phone out, and I was 10 and 2, but I had the phone out, and... <laughs> Or if my mom asks you somehow, I was 10 and 2, okay? But we, we're driving up, and we missed a turn. Like, this is not a hard drive from St. Louis up here, but we missed a turn, right? And this was before we got out of St. Louis area. It wasn't even like, hey, we're in a part we don't normally drive in. Like, we missed a turn. It wasn't Shane's fault. He wasn't driving. It was my fault. As the person who's not driving, we don't have to have every answer. We get to go along for the ride and enjoy the scenery. We get to go along for the ride and enjoy the journey that we're on. It is up to the driver to make sure we get there. And so God is the driver. We see in verse 17, it says, Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up into the Negeb, go up into the hill country and see what the land is and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, and whether the, the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds. And whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are trees in it or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin to Rehob near Lebohamath. There they went up into the Negev and came to Hebron, Ahaman, Shashai, and Talmai. The descendants of Anak were there. Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came to the valley of Eshol and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two of them. They also brought some pomegranates and figs. The place was called the valley of Eshol because of the cluster that the people of Israel cut down from there. I couldn't avoid every name. And so you're just saying with confidence if you don't know what they mean. Right? But we get this picture of God saying, okay, go into this land. And if you look at what those maps in the back of the Bible that as a kid you always looked at when you didn't want to pay attention... And maybe that was just me. But like those maps in the back, if you look at them, like this route that he sends them on, they go up through this hill, this hill of country, and it's the most inconvenient route he could send them. It's, it's not the easy way. It's through rough like terrain and territory, starting and going in this area that's, hey, there's some pretty tough people there. And so he sends them into this land, and then we get this picture of they cover this whole land. And they're there for 40 days. They go from edge to edge, top to bottom, and they see it all. They, they get this full view of it. And while I'm reading this, I have to ask myself the question, why did he send them? Because if we look back in verse 1 or 2 there, he says, this is the land that I'm going to give you. God already knows what he's going to do. God already knows that he's going to give them this land So why does he want them to go look at it? It's not like God needs their report, like, oh, I was unaware that these people now live here. God knows exactly what it is. When you go to the movies, there's always the previews to start the show. And they're trying to get you to go see the movie that is coming out later. And you get kind of a broad overview of what this movie's about. You see the good things, you see the good and the kind of peak moments that they're going to have, and you also see some of the trouble that they're going to go through. 
And you get the overall story of what is going to happen in this. And that's what God has given them here. He has given them a preview, a, a sneak peek of what they're going to see. And the question I have then is like, why? It's just going to scare them. As we'll see in a second, like, hey, there's giants here. Like, when they're coming to the Red Sea, like, that just happened to them. They didn't know that was going to happen. They didn't have time to, like, panic and overthink it and be scared. Like, it just happened. But now they're at a point where God has said, hey, I want you to see this. I am giving you this land, and I want you to go in and look at it. And so they see there are good things, and they see there are scary things. But it is God giving them this picture that, hey, this is what I'm going to do. And in order for you to appreciate what I'm going to do for you, you have to see what is going to happen. That you have an, a better grasp of how good and great I am when you see what I'm going to do for you. They're not driving. They're just getting to go along for the ride. And God says, hey, go and take a look. Look out the window as we go. See what I'm going to do for you. See how I am going to come through for you. And so they've, they've spied out this land. And they're at the point of, okay, we have a pretty good view. It's been 40 days. We got a pretty good understanding of that. And they got a, a real good like, perspective of what it is. And so they're going to come back and they're going to share. So number one, don't overthink it. Number two, you're not driving. You're along for the ride. And number three, your perspective will determine your willingness to take the step that's ahead of you. Your perspective will will determine your willingness to take the step that's ahead of you. So these spies have come back, and now they're going to give a report of what happened. Verse 25 it says, At the end of the 40 days they returned from spying out the land, and they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land, and they told him, We came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. And this, is, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of, uh, of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. All right, so they've not done anything wrong yet. They've just said, hey, this is what we saw. We have these huge grapes, <laughs> We have a huge cluster of grapes. Like the, this is a really, really good land. It's a fantastic place. And I think we have to understand where they're at to understand how good this seems. Like, that seems awesome that they can carry grapes on a stick between them. Like, two grown men have to carry these grapes. Like, if you go to Schnooks or something, like, it's about that big. Like, you don't need a stick. If you do that, you're going to look weird. Right? But it's just this picture of a beautiful, lush land full of good things. And they've come back, back into this wilderness to report to the people and they're gathered around in a desolate, desert, empty place. Sand, jagged rocks, nothing. The sun's beating down on them. Like, it's, it's not a place I want to be. And it's a picture of where God is taking them is so much better than where they're at right now. And so they're saying, hey, this is awesome, it's great. There are some issues. There's some, there's some tough people there. There's some enemies there. There are some people that are going to be hard t- for us to uh, defeat. There are some giants there. There are some issues to overcome. And so they've laid out what this is. And now we see two very different uh, perspectives of what they saw. The same guys that went in, they saw the exact same stuff. It's not like they split up in groups and there's one group that went and saw like the grape area and was like, this is fantastic. And the others went and saw the giants. They saw it all. And then they all had the same view, but they come with two very different perspectives of what they should do. In verse 30, but Caleb, who's one of the guys that went, quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Actually, have this, like, hey, we can do this, right? This is the guy that, like, sees the challenge, like, hey, not a problem. We can, we can make this happen. And so he's like, yeah, let's do this. But... The other side of it, the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we are. So they brought in the people of Israel, so they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. 
And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. So we have this point of where we've seen this amazing thing, but now we have one guy who will later be joined by Joshua, what we'll see in a second. So two guys who say, hey, we can do this. And then you have ten of them who say, this land will eat us alive. This land will devour us. They've already been told by God, this is the land that I will give you. And they've gotten the preview, and they've gotten this view of, okay, this is what God wants to do for us. And they still come out with two very different views. View view number one, right, is the ten guys. They see obstacles. Like, there are giants. This is a problem. We will not defeat them. We we might as well not go. They're overwhelmed by the obstacles of life and they fail to see the provisions of God. You may be there too. Life may be happening and hitting you and there's family stuff, there's financial stuff, there's, there's just the, the things of life that happen to you. And you're overwhelmed. You're like, man, I can't go where God's wanting me to go. This stuff's in the way. And I can't handle this. And when we're at that point where we are at this view of like these problems are so real and I don't have an answer, so why do I even look to where God wants me to go? I can't even handle the moment I'm in now. That's one perspective. Then the other um, perspective doesn't say there are no obstacles. So I think we kind of bounce between the pessimist and the optimist of like, hey, just because you're trusting and following God doesn't mean you don't see that there's issues. doesn't mean that you don't see there's obstacles. It means that you see those obstacles as opportunities. Those are opportunities for God to be God, for God to do what he said he would do, for God to come through, for God to be faithful to himself and to glorify himself. And having that perspective that Caleb has, that Joshua will see has, that perspective allows us that that I don't have to have a perfect life, that I don't have to have that six-lane highway that God has paved and it's perfect and there's never an issue on it, that that's the only way that I can follow God's will for my life. When I have the view of life and and this perspective of, God, obstacles that come in my way are opportunities for me to trust you and for you to do what you can do, and I'm just along for the ride, that's what we want to have. That's a faith that can last and be sustained. But to have that perspective, right, I think we can say, yeah, I want that. But how do I get that perspective? How in the world do I get to that point? Number four, the last thing, my perspective is determined by what I trust most. See, if you look back at what those guys said when they came back, they said, we aren't strong enough. They are bigger than us. We can't do this. It's all about themselves. It's all about what they feel they can handle, what they can do, because they trust more than anything they trust themselves. That if I can't see an answer within myself, if I can't take care of this myself, then there's no one else that can do this. Verse 1 of chapter 14. They've brought this report. And the response of the people says, Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. So they have been given. God has said, Hey, this is what I want for you. This is what I have for you. I will do this. And they see obstacles. And they can't see an answer in themselves. And so they say, I would rather go back to the slavery and awful life that I have because I know it and I can be comfortable in it rather than take a step and follow God where he wants me to go. And we can look at people like this and be like, wow, that's ridiculous, but we've done it. You've done it. You've not taken that step God has put in front of you because you're worried about something you can't handle. Because you have trust in yourself rather than in him. What I trust most 
what I trust most will determine my perspective. If I trust myself, then I'm only going to deal with what I can handle, and I can go no further than that. And I think if we're honest, we can say, God, I've asked you for your will. I've asked you for this, and you've not revealed it to me. He says, no, it's right here. You're saying, but that's not as easy as I want it to be. So that can't be what you want for me because I can't do that. And his answer is, no, you can't. Let me take you. Jump in, ride shotgun. You can be DJ and let God drive. But we want to drive too. We have that awful the response of let's go back to what was awful for us, what God has already saved us from. But then verse 5 says, Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we passed through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. Not, hey, we, we can't do this. Not there's giants. It's the land that we are sent to, it is good. And this next part is the crucial part. If the Lord delights in us, not if we can beat giants, not if we can take this city, not if we can figure out a way to do this, but if God delights in us, if God delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Not taking the step God has for you is rebellion against the Lord. He's saying, don't, don't go against what God wants for you because you're scared. And do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. They have this view that says, if God says it, it will happen. And their perspective is dependent on God being trustworthy. And they say, God, we trust you. Why do we trust you? Because we know who you are. We know that you were trustworthy for Joseph and that you worked out and came through and were faithful for him. You were faithful to your people when they were in slavery and you came through and you saved them and you rescued them. You were faithful and you came through and you rescued them at the Red Sea when they thought there was no way out. You came through. When we were wandering and had nothing to eat, you came through every day. Every morning we woke up and we're reminded that you come through and will always come through. So when we come up against this obstacle that we're at, this thing that I think I can't do, this thing that I think I'm not able to get over, I am not going to be like the 10 who said, God, I need you when I need you, but other than that, I'm living my life. I want to be like these two guys who said, God, I will remember your faithfulness and my faith will be built on remembering the faithfulness that you have had to your people for generation after generation after generation and every time you come through, my faith grows because I see you do amazing things that only you can do and I will trust you in the next thing, not because I know how to do it, but because I know you are faithful then, you'll be faithful now. My perspective is based on what I trust and I trust you, Jesus. One of the weirdest things in here as we wrap up that I just it made no sense to me when I read it you're like when he says and do not fear the people of the land for they are bread for us like what what is that like we're going to eat them for lunch right but remember this is a people that is used to God providing every morning there's bread laid out for them every morning they come out of their tent and it is there for them to pick up and take and it is a picture of God saying hey I've got this for you they're bread for you they're Like, I I have put them there for you. I have put them there for you to overcome, for you to walk with me through this and see how I come through. As we wrap it up, this is what we have to come to. I can trust God now when I don't have the answers because he's always been the answer before. And I have no reason to think he won't be the answer in the future. And I don't have to have the answer because I walk with my answer. And he goes with me. It's a song by Phil Wickham called The Battle Belongs that I think sums up the mindset we have to have. And we'll close with this and then we'll pray. He says, when all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain moved. As I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now. I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees. 
With my hands lifted high, O oh God, the battle belongs to you. In every fear, I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Not verse 1 of chapter 14 where it says they raised a loud cry and people wept that night. It is, I will sing in the night. God, I am not afraid. But when I look at the morning that is to come, I will sing through the night knowing you will come through. I don't know how, but I get to watch. I will sing through the night. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. Thank you, God. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. Where is your trust? What are you trusting? God has a path and a plan. It's not hidden. You don't have to have the answers, but you have to have the right perspective that says my trust is in Jesus and he will get me through and he will walk with me and carry me and he's going to take me places I never thought I'd go. He will use me in the ways he wants me to for his glory and for his name. Let's pray. God, we love you. As we, as we spend time in your word this morning, God, I thank you that you are a faithful God. God, that our faith can be built on what you have done and how you've been faithful to yourself, to your word, that you will glorify yourself. God, would you glorify yourself through us? God, would we be people that don't need a six-lane highway for a path of our lives? But God, we will walk with you through the rocky, rough like terrain, through the obstacles, knowing that you'll carry us when you need to. You'll move mountains when you need to. And we just get to walk with you, trusting you that you will handle it and you will take care of it. God, I want to be able to look back on my life and say that I have walked with you through things that I never thought I could handle. And God, in the moment, we will think it's insurmountable, but you can do it all, and we trust you. Will we not limit our path to what we can handle, but to what you want to do and where you want to take us. In your name, amen.